Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, the last disorder we're going to talk about today, I was going to say today, I think I try to say today and tonight at the same time, um, <laughs> but it is today, tonight-ish. Um, so whatever way you want to look at it. Anyway, um, the last part of my eye lecture is going to be about glaucoma. And out of all the disorders that I've talked about, cataracts, retinal detachment, this is probably one that you're going to interact with the most and not that you're going to have to do a lot with it. But out of all of the um, eye disorders, this is the one, well, I mean, vision loss, yes. But the one you're going to see in patient's history, the one that you're going to see on the NCLEX, this is the most because there's a lot of like, there's a lot of prevalence in this. This is related to diabetes. It has a lot of, um, it had, there's a lot of medications they can test over for this. Um, there's two types of glaucoma. So um, just definitely out of all of them, I'm not saying don't study the other ones because there's going to be questions on all of them, at least on our exam. But um, just know out of all of them, this is probably the one that you want to familiarize yourself the most because um, you're going to see it as a reoccurring theme. So what is glaucoma? So think of a coma as maybe too much pressure in your brain and a glaucoma is too much pressure in your eyeball. So pretty much think, uh, and this is like, so I've taught this, like I'm going into my sixth year and, um, you know, I don't know what clicked for me this time, but I think I finally understand. And I've been very misinformed about the difference between open angle and angle closure, closed angle, um, for a long time, but I think I finally get it. And I think I got a cool analogy too. So, um, this is the most excited I'll ever be for eyeballs. So just roll with me. Um, so pretty much, well, let me start with this. So like, it's too much pressure on the eyeball. Um, it's a very, what well, the second leading cause of blindness, a very high cause of blindness, um, but it can be prevented if we do that fun puff test early, which is so much fun. Everyone loves like to sit there in the eye doctor's office and just be waiting and there'll be like, and then like, they don't tell you when, and then it's like puff and it's like, oh, you know, it, it, you lose all your trust. Um, but think of this as like eyeball ischemia. All of the blood vessels in your eye are in the back and there's pressure building up in the front of your eye because stuff is not draining correctly. Um, and so it leads to pressure on the back of your eye, which can lead to blindness. So the big thing here again is going to be about vision loss. Um, but what happens is in the front of your eye, there is a angle that is open usually um, to allow for drainage. Like there's um, uh, what we call aqueous fluid, um, eyeball fluid that is supposed to be draining. So two types of glaucoma, two types of problems. You can either have what's called open angle glaucoma. This is where you're drained. So think of it like you're draining your sink. Um, it is open. The drain is open. There's no issue with the, uh, what do you call it? The drain itself. Um, but what happens is, is that there is a um, there's no like issue with the angle, like your, your drain is open, but it starts to get clogged. So there's this thing called the trabic trabicular, I'm probably saying that wrong network or mesh. So, oh, but I heard something. Um, so, but what happens is, is that effect? I don't know why the ghosts have to come in like right at this moment. I'm like, I think I heard something. And then my fridge starts talking to me, but I'm trying to do something really important here, guys. Um, so these ghosts could chill out for a second, but anyway, so you have this, so you have this drain that starts getting clogged. So, um, in, um, open angle, your ankle stays open. So the ability to drain stays open. There's no complete blockage. There's still ability to drain, but it just starts to get clogged. So think of kind of like in your shower drain, when it gets clogged with hair and just the flow is not as good. So you can't get as much, um, like the, you know, there starts to be like a backup, like this is what starts to happen with open ankle. It's slow. It's a chronic thing. Um, you know, and they can take meds and stuff and manage it. Their ankle is still open. So they still have a drain. So the drain still exists. They're still able to drain. It's just slow. It's clogged. Like it's getting clogged up, um, you know, getting kind of, oh, Jesus. Hold on a sec. Cat fight. One second. I swear one day these cats will be passed and I'll be able to make a video where I do not have to um, constantly get after it. Or maybe I'll have a better working space so that I do not have to deal with these fights. Um, or even if just one of them would pass away, it'd be great. Less fighting. So I love my pets, but there's also a certain point where um, when one of them is like hissing at her own shadow, that is just too much. Anyway, I had this really great idea for the glaucoma and trying to tell the story, but apparently the ghosts and the cats don't want me to get to my punchline. So I'm gonna back up a little bit here and say open angle. The angle's open, so the drain is free to drain, except it's starting to get clogged. So think, um, you know, like hair getting clogged in a drain, it's draining slower. So pressure's building up, but it's building up slowly. Um, and so it's not overwhelming. And again, this can be managed. 
Um, then there's what's called angle closure. With angle closure, think of when you put the stopper in the drain. There is nothing draining. All it is is building up. So, you know, with open angle, drain is open, but it's getting clogged. Angle closure, you're putting the stopper in the drain. So nothing is draining. There is no ability to drain at all and stuff just building up. And when that, um, in the eyeball, when that stuff is building up, it pushes up against the back of the eyeball and leads to um, ischemia, eyeball ischemia. You know, I always got to bring it back to cardiac um, eyeball ischemia, um, or, um, you know, there's a complete blockage, which leads, can lead to blindness. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm sorry for all of the back and forth, but I do find it hope. Well, I should say, I do hope you find it a little endearing. At least it's never boring. And maybe it's testing to see if you're still awake watching this. All right. So, um, what are my assessments and expected findings for glaucoma? Um, we are going to do measures and tests for intraocular pressure. You do not need to know the normal intraocular pressure, or anything like that. Um, but just know that that's one of the you know priority tests that we're going to do. We also will check for visual acuity um, to see how they're seeing, because again, as this gets worse, their vision can get off. And then we're also going to check for peripheral vision. This will make more sense in a minute when I talk about symptoms for open angle. Um, so, and then a doctor can do that slip lamp micros, uh, I can say it, microscopy. I think that's it. Um, and they can look at the actual angle. Cause again, if it's completely closed, it's a very, like, I mean, if there is a stopper in the drain there, it's completely closed. There's no drainage happening. It's a very different treatment than if I'm just getting clogged. Um, and this picture hopefully displays it. This open angle, you can see this angle is open. There's an ability to drain. Um, but the problem is, is in this, um, there's just a clog starting to build up in the drainage hole. There's just, it's not able to drain as well. Whereas the closed angle, the angle is closed. Um, it is completely blocked. The stopper's in there. We cannot get anything drained. So um, we definitely want to know, is it open or closed? Um, and the other difference, you might see this um, listed as chronic open angle. Um, or, you know, the other one, the, um, it might be, you might see it called angle closure, um, or acute glaucoma. That's the one where it's closed. So angle closure, acute glaucoma, emergency, um, open angle glaucoma. I have an, I have a semi open or I have an open drain. I'm just getting a little clogged. It's chronic. <laughs> so you can kind of think the C for chronic is clogged, um, for open angle. Um, so like I mentioned with open angle, it develops slowly. Usually they have no symptoms and they can always have no symptoms, but um, they might occasionally have mild pain, but usually no symptoms. The, usually this is one like the, uh, what happens is they have no symptoms. Then, you know, all of a sudden one day they notice that they can't see in their periphery. So they start to lose their, they start to have what we call tunnel vision or they lose their peripheral vision. So this is why we want to do that peripheral vision exam to see, um, you know, and a lot of times it's like testing to see, like we kind of put like a finger out here and see if they can see when it moves. Um, and if they, they're losing their peripheral vision, they wouldn't be able to see that. Um, and then with acute ankle closure glaucoma, remember everything we've talked about so far has been a vision loss issue, but the one thing we haven't had is pain. So the only eye disorder that should have um, pain that will kind of cue you to say, ding, 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 this is it, is going to be acute angle closure or closed angle glaucoma. Um, so this is the only one with pain. So if you have a test question, sudden, severe, like eye pain, you should be like, ding, ding, ding. It has to be acute angle closure glaucoma. Um, so they have a sudden excruciating pain or pr uh, pressure. Um, and like I mentioned, it's the only one with pain. They can also have some GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting. They may have colored halos around their lights. Um, and then um, very like blurred vision or change to their vision. Because remember, there's all that stuff. There is no ability to drain anything. Pressure builds up and pushes on the back of that eyeball and takes away their vision. Um, so eye pain, GI symptoms, vision loss, colored halos. So uh, much more severe, sudden symptoms. Um, better or worse, it's going to look a lot like the other things we talked about, except, you know, maybe considering um, uh, their symptoms too. So chronic, if they have decreased intraocular pressures, no issues, like no new symptoms, um, no, 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 like their peripheral vision's better, um, then they're getting worse. If their uh, intraocular pressure is getting increased, if they're showing new or acute symptoms, 
um if something changed like they go kind of towards like in it's not that chronic can be chronic of course could become acute they could have both um but um it's not that everyone who's chronic ends up with acute um so but um you want to look for any new changes or anything that's sudden um or worsening to their vision, of course, would be another sign that things are getting worse. Acute, same thing. Um, and then like the worst possible outcome would of course be the visual loss or blindness would be um, the, the, of course, the one I would not want. So let's do a question. A nurse is caring for a client who has a history of hyperopia and cataracts. The client calls the nurse to the room complaining of sudden severe eye pain and vomiting. Hmm, what did I say? Sudden severe eye pain is... Acute glaucoma. So it says, what is the nurse's priority action? So really this is asking, there's a lot of other data in here, but really all that I need to know is if someone has an acute onset of glaucoma, acute narrow angle, uh, sorry, acute closed angle um, glauco glaucoma, um, what is my priority action? So my first choice is to check vital signs. Well, that might give me some information, but I'm not really sure that their vital signs would be changing immediately. I mean, their blood pressure might be up because they're hurting, but I mean, I don't really know how that's going to give me any information because anytime I'm sitting here thinking about this, I want to think about, okay, do I need to do an assessment? Do I need to call the doctor or is there an intervention I need to do? Like what's going to save their life? This is an emergency situation. So we have two emergencies under eyes. The first one's going to be retinal detachment. The second one's going to be acute um, angle closure, or closed angle glaucoma. So um, am I taking action to do an intervention? Am I doing an assessment or am I calling the doctor? And so when I'm thinking about this, I want to think about, is there any data or information I have to have before I call the doctor that they're going to need to make a decision? Um, or, um, you know, would doing any intervention or assessment delay life-saving treatment? So it's one of those things I have to think about. Anyway, so vital signs, I don't think that that's something like if I call the doctor and say, hey, there's this change in this patient, that they're not going to be like, what are their vital signs? Like, I just can't imagine it because it's an eye problem and eye, severe eye pain is not a normal thing. Um, do a visual acuity exam. Now, this might help. It'd be good to know what their vision is. But if someone's having sudden severe eye pain and vomiting, it doesn't really seem like the right time. Um, you know, and um, on top of that, this seems like an emergency. So if I do that, that's going to delay um, life-saving treatment because the visual acuity is not going to necessarily change their treatment plan. Um, call the healthcare provider. This may, this is the top of my option so far because this is an emergency and I don't think there's anything I can do as the nurse without getting an order to decrease that intraocular pressure. Um, and then administer Timolol drops. So I know that the chronic glaucoma that they're on beta blocker drops, but I think with the acute, while they may get that, this is not going to be the life-saving treatment. I don't know if it's going to work quick enough. And even if I, if this is the treatment, um, I, this is, seems like there's a change or something new or different in this patient. It seems like the best action for me is to call the doctor first because they may need emergent surgery and other things. Maybe the doctor will want to give those drops, but this seems like a sudden change that I need to call the doctor because there's nothing else that I can do um, that's going to save this person's life or that I have to tell the doctor, just calling them and saying, hey, all of a sudden now they have this sudden severe eye pain, they're vomiting. Um, that's probably going to be a time they're going to want to come in. They may order some things, but the first thing I need to do is check in with them because this is an emergency. So C is the correct answer. So for closed angle, um, the emergency, uh, the treatments, of course, are going to be to decrease the intra, everything, all these are going to decrease the intraocular pressure because all that pressure is building up. It's a clogged sink. So I'm, what can I do to get the, I'm not, not clogged. I don't want to say clogged. It is a closed off sink. I put the plug in the sink so nothing can drain. Um, so this is an ocular emergency. What can I do to reduce that uh, intraocular pressure fast? Um, so usually they're going to need some sort of procedure to create an opening in the iris to allow for fluid to drain. Um, some of those procedures, one of them is called a laser peripheral iridotomy or a surgical iridotomy. And I might be saying those wrong, but it sounds pretty professional to me. Um, but you don't have to know in depth about those, but effectively we're just taking the, taking the plug out so that it can drain again. We're creating a new opening. Um, and they might be on medications to decrease the amount of fluid that they're making or to also help to allow for fluid to get out easier. Um, now, you do not have to know all those medications, but just know that those um, those do exist, uh, that they're going to have there are medications. And these are all they're all eye drops that we can use. There might be some more. IV, there might be one that's IV, but most of them are all intra intraocular drops. 
Um, but yeah, just mostly focus on they need emergent surgery and they may need some medications that are going to help along the way too. All right, so this is a drag and drop process, uh, practice. So a nurse is caring for a client who is uh, scheduled, should say scheduled to receive their Timolol eye drops at nine o'clock. Drag the data that would be a contraindication for giving this medication at this time. So Timolol, so it's a beta blocker. So the things that I want to remember about beta blockers is I'm, I want to be careful in patients with diabetes. I want to be cautious in patients with asthma, COPD, or restrictive airway disease. And I want to be concerned um, about anyone who has a low blood pressure, low heart rate. Um, like we're going to hold for a heart rate less than 60, because this is just like other beta blockers. And um, in case you're wondering, this is a non-cardio selective. So um, the first one is heart rate 109. So like, you know, if you're in your head, you're like, oh, something about the heart rate, you could easily choose this one, but a heart rate of 109, if I give the Timolol drops, even if they are systemically absorbed, which just because you give eye drops doesn't mean they're going to be systemically absorbed, but you want to be careful um, that, um, you know, it does not necessarily, um, the, this would not be a bad thing. If they got the Timolol drops, their heart rate goes down a little bit cool. Like it's not going to hurt anything. Um, their heart rate's not low. I don't worry about their heart rate being high. I do worry about it being low. The next one is their blood pressure, 109 over 67. So that's uh, a normal blood pressure. You know, some people might say it's on the low end of normal, but they still have, um, you know, they're still getting good perfusion and stuff there. Um, and so it's not necessarily a contraindication. Now, if their blood pressure had a systolic less than 100, um, things like that, I'd be a little bit more concerned. So now we have client has a history of asthma. So this is one of the things that I mentioned. Um, the Temelol drops, since they're non-cardio selective, they can lead to bronchospasm. So I would say that this is the first one I would say is a contraindication to giving this. The next one is a history of hypertension. If you're a story writer, like I know many students are, I love you. I write stories in my head too. So I feel your pain. Um, you might create a story that they're like, oh, well, if they have hypertension, they're already going to be getting a beta blocker and they can't take two beta blockers at the same time. Well, you don't know what they're getting. And um, usually, you know, if they're on a beta blocker for their hypertension, we're not going to give both of these. But it's all it's saying is just straight up, just having a history of hypertension alone, does that stop you from being able to get beta blocker eye drops? And it does not. Because <laughs> there's nothing about the diagnosis of hypertension itself that can stop you from getting your drops like you need. Um, history of heart failure. So most people would say this is the same as the history of hypertension. However, specifically with heart failure, your book talks about this, um, beta blocker eye drops are a are contraindicated in patients with heart failure. So this is going to seem kind of confusing because patients that have heart failure are on beta blockers. Um, but um, with heart failure, what we're going to be concerned about is if they get these beta blocker eye drops that can actually slow down their heart rate, which can slow down their cardiac output, which could lead to some serious issues. So um, beta blockers themselves are not contraindicated, uh, contraindicated in heart failure, but beta blocker eye drops are. Now, uh, in real life, I'm sure there's plenty of patients with heart failure that are on these eye drops, but in perfect nursing school world, contraindicated. All right. The client has a history of cataracts. So um, people that have glaucoma and cataracts may be the same because diabetes um, have, people with diabetes have a higher rate of both cataracts and glaucoma. So um, I don't think that having cataracts alone is going to be a contraindication. So the only two here that I see would actually, I'd have to be like, take a pause, talk to the doctor is going to be C and E. So history of asthma or history of heart failure, the rest, they are safe to give. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so narrow angle or open angle, um, chronic glaucoma, um, the, what you want to think about for this one now I'm like looking at the narrow angle and I'm wondering if I, um, maybe it is called narrow angle, but consider this, this should say open angle chronic glaucoma. So that's just, just to be safe. Cause I always, there's like narrow, open angle closure, blah, blah, blah. But think the angle is closed or it's open. So this should be open angle, um, chronic glaucoma. Um, the goal overall is going to be for them to have stable, um, intraocular pressures. Cause remember this is chronic over time, not an emergency. I just want to over time for them to maintain stable. Um, the treatments that we're going to do is going to be, um, you know, they may need some surgeries, like some things to open up areas in their eyeballs to allow for better drainage. That would, it's not something like quick or major. Hold on one second. 
sorry about that. Um, so, but um, yeah, as a whole, um, they may need surgery or they may need a procedure um, just kind of over time. Because again, this is like the one that has the clog sink. Just, you know, think of like using Drano, they might need some stuff to kind of unclog the drain. You can see it's all in that trabicular network, the trabiculectomy. So like, it's just looking at the drain, maybe they need their drain replaced. Um, so then, um, long-term, the medications you're going to see on these patients are usually going, and there's a variety of them, but the, the most common ones are going to be beta blocker or alpha, um, agonists, which are actually alpha blocker eye drops. So these are all eye drops. So these are two meds you do need to know for this test. But again, all you need to know is, is that for beta blockers, they can lower your heart rate um, and your blood pressure. So caution on those and the other stuff I brought up in the last question careful and, um, you know, those with, uh, I like, you know, the eye diseases, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, be careful in those with, um, airway diseases like asthma, COPD, um, and then, um, use caution in patients. Um, uh, what was I going to say, um, with diabetes, just that it can cause, um, higher chance of that masking that hypoglycemia and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, um, so that you just need to know the basics, the same stuff that you kind of knew about beta blockers for the other ones. Um, then alpha blockers, um, the same thing where just except it's the heart rate's not an issue, all the other stuff. The only thing you need to worry about with those is just the blood pressure. Um, they might get other medications too, to decrease the amount of aqueous fluid being um, produced, like the med, the same meds I talked about for the acute, um, or like, you know, meds that are going to increase the amount of like pretty much. So think of it this way. I either need to stop making so much eyeball fluid or um, drain it better. You do not need to know those meds, but there, there's a whole bunch of them um, as a whole know that with beta blocker eye drops, there are cardio selective ones and non cardio selective ones. And I wish that they still like, they were very similar. Like um, some of them are, you know, there was that whole rule for beta blockers, like A through M is going to be, um, you know, the cardio selective and then N through Z is non cardio selective and it's not as perfect. Um, we're probably not going to give you anything tricky but most of the time we, we do a lot of the same ones. Um, but, um, just know that there is a difference there, um, but we're not trying to trick you too much. We're really trying to get to the basics. Mostly it's usually about the heart rate, um, or about their blood pressure, not being too low. And just you recognizing that eye drops can be systemically absorbed. I think that's all I'm going to say about that. Oh, no, I have got one more slide. Um, overall, as the nurse, um, those were all the medical treatments, but overall, as the nurse, I want to make sure that um, we are maintaining vision, preventing vision loss. So um, like I mentioned for this, this is a very preventable way to, uh, there's a lot of prevention that we can do here so that they don't have to lose their vision, regular visual checks, um, and um, especially whether they, they're diagnosed or not, um, but regular vision checks. Um, regular eye exams should be done once you're age 40 um, to 54 every two to four years, ages 55 to 60. 64 every one to three years. And once you're over 65, every one to two years, if you have diabetes, you should be getting eye exams every year. Um, you want to, as the nurse also teach them general medication education, like what are the side effects of the meds, like we talked about, um, and then how to administer eye drops and especially wanting to prevent that systemic absorption. Um, but yeah, overall prevention is key, getting those regular eye exams, that fun puff test and, um, uh, looking for changes in intraocular pressure, looking for changes in vision, but a um, very preventable way to um, not lose your vision, even though it's not fun. Next on to ears. See you for the next one.